He was gone and supposedly never to return. With the absence of Muhammad Ali, deja vu hit as the World Boxing Association once again had to crown a champion. Ten years earlier in the late 60s, they held an eight-man tournament. This time around, the action revolved around four chosen youngsters, two of which were controversial South Africans, around which the WBA hoped to frame interest. They were ranked by the WBA numbers 1, 3, 4, and 5. Where's number 2, you ask? It was the Black Destroyer, Ernie Shavers, who you may recall from the 70s timeline was busy staging his 1974 George Foreman impression of slugging away Ken Norton before losing a title bout against uh, I mean Larry Holmes. Point is, he had his hands tied pursuing the WBC strap. But imagine if he were in this tournament. Hmm. Number four ranked Leon Spinks was fresh off losing the big time against the shadow of Ali. He had the most to gain, perhaps. Number three ranked John Tate had just finished off Dwayne Bobbick, the man once believed to be the future of the division. Number five ranked Harry Katsia was unbeaten in the ring, but burdened by a bionic right hand, though some claim it gave him an unfair advantage. Number one ranked Cali Canuzzi was on an 11 fight win streak since his loss to opposite end thinker Harry Katsia. Outside of the ring, he was a cop known for shooting a black protester at a 1977 rally. Whereas Kosia had addressed the blemish of apartheid, Kanutsi didn't seem to be in a hurry to take a stand against the injustice. Two sides of the South African coin and both sure to draw eyes and money to the Eliminator series in which South Africa could finally crown their first champion. Was it to be? Let's find out. Here's a timeline of the 1979 WBA Heavyweight Eliminator Series. On cue, Kanutsi came out fast as Tate composed himself and stuck to boxing his opponent around the ring. Despite the crowd's reaction for every Kanutsi lunge and flurry, he wasn't doing much of anything else than wasting energy and feeding right into the patient Tate's game plan. Big John continued using his jab, mixing in rights, until Cali exploded into a crowd rising assault in the second. Tate remained poised encountered the eager Kanutsi, giving him something to think about. Kanutsi staged an even better flurry in the third that had the crowd anxious for the knockout, but he missed his window as, once again, John Tate weathered the storm. Truth be told, Tate deflected many of the big blows as Cali wasted further energy and looked gassed to end the third. From the fourth on, Tate wore Kanutsi down and handed him a beating that showed under his right eye and from his nose bleeding. But Kanutsi never stopped coming forward. Kelly had his last gasp in the opening minute of the eighth, but ran out of gas as Tate teed off before the referee stoppage. Tate had Kanutsi dancing around the ring on instinct of survival. Kanutsi later claimed that Tate cracked his ribs, which would explain why he seemed so winded after the third. Perhaps. Up next, former undisputed champion Leon Spinks and Harry Katsia to determine who would join John Tate in the title bout. Contrary to the slow, methodical breakdown of Tate Kanutsi, 
Sphinx Kate say was a firework. Sphinx came out for the kill, swinging for the fences, but Kate say immediately capitalized with counters and dropped Sphinx for the first time in his career. Base first at that. He answered and was decked again by the famous Kate say bionic right. He got up again and was forced to dance his way across the ring to the canvas a third time. Leon's recklessness had destroyed his chances of returning to the big time. Oh, that's all she wrote as it was waved off and Harry Katsia had stamped his ticket to the vacant WBA title bout against John Tate. It was quite the upset. Before they could get it on, however, Muhammad Ali had to officially retire and vacate the championship. Thankfully, this occurred the very next month and the bout was on, scheduled for October 20th. And the finale. The clash between the tournament's quick finisher and methodical drowner. The former, Harry Kutsia, had home court advantage. Again, recalling a timeline of the 1970s heavyweight boxing division, this fight has gone down more so in history for its cultural impact surrounding apartheid in South Africa as opposed to it being a great or even good fight. Enough context, let's break down the fight. Once again, John Tate went about dancing. He was jumpy, slippery, doing his best Ali take. Kaysay spent the first chasing him and enticing audience reactions with flurries that did no damage, just as Kanutsi before him had done. The second saw the same with the addition of late round countering from Tate. The final 10 seconds of the third saw Kaysay land the bionic right and send Tate to the ropes, but the hurt man was able to tie up and survive another potentially deadly bionic right. The opening of the fourth once again saw Kate say unbalance Tate, his glove almost touching the mat as he fell back. After another right that caused him to nearly slip himself, Kate say found himself on the retreat as Tate upped the pressure. A Tate right to the body seemingly made Kate say nearly slip as he backed into a corner. Nearly. Tate spent the rest of the round familiarizing his right with Harry's face. Midway through the fifth, both men exchanged their best blows up to that point in the fight. Midway through the sixth, Tate appeared to land a right that dropped Kate but it was ruled a slip. A replay revealed that the punch landed, but Harry slipped after the fact, and Tate almost landed a punch after the slip that would have gotten him disqualified. By the ninth, Harry had slowed considerably and Tate was landing more as Kate Say was on the back foot. A strong right hurt Kate Say in the 11th and Tate followed up by continuing to shove and lean his 240 pounds onto his opponent. Tate continued landing almost at will, slowing Kate Say with each blow. Defiantly, he tried hanging on and exchanging in the 12th with Tate but was bested each time. The Tate rights became entire combos. In the 14th, Big John had Kate say practically moonwalking at high speed to avoid his right, and it led to another slip for the South African. Kate say may have been saved from a knockdown by the ropes in the closing seconds of the round as well. The 15th was do or die for Kate say who needed a knockout to win. Despite this, it was Tate who remained on the offensive. He closed strong, cornering and peppering Kate Logically, Big John Tate was announced the winner by unanimous decision and was headed into the 1980s as the WBA heavyweight champion of the world. Hopes for unification with WBC champion Larry Holmes were high for the pending 1980. Whether it went through or not, however, is a story for another documentary. Speaking of which, 
Perhaps it was the speed run of a backdrop and main event that propelled the division into the chaos that was the 1980s. So many fighters, but not enough time to build the blocks of any more true champions. You'll see what I mean. I hope you enjoyed this prelude to The Lost Generation. I'm still at work on The Lost Generation docuseries, haven't uploaded in a while, and I wanted to say thank you for the surge and support this past May. Amazing birthday present. Have no fear, I'm alive and well, and the videos will never stop unless I explicitly say so. The Lost Generation. Now what does that mean? World War I was an unprecedented conflict that resulted in an entire generation of young Americans feeling aimless. The traditional values they were taught growing up were brought into question by the horrors of wartime. They lacked drive, became reckless, were self-destructive, and shifted more toward pursuing materialism rather than abstract ideas. They were preceded by a conservative world that was rooted in faith and ideal, but succeeded by the greatest generation, sandwiched between two great time periods and suffering while the other two thrived. Now, what does this have anything to do with boxing? Simple, the parallel. It seems that periods of stability are always immediately followed by chaos. In world affairs, and in boxing. Around 70 years after the inception of the Lost Generation, an entire generation of heavyweight boxers would also receive this label, regarded as aimless, reckless, and self-destructive. They were preceded by the Golden Age of Heavyweights and succeeded by the Silver Age of Heavyweights. The pattern continues. Sandwiched between prosperity. The lost generation of heavyweights. Now, what does that mean? It actually takes on multiple meanings. Wasted talent, underrated exploits, and tragic endings. This era isn't to be covered in the usual style of a chronological super documentary, as is the norm on Boxingpedia at least not yet anyway, but rather in a series of short retrospectives. The 10-year span of 1978, when Leon Spinks was stripped of the undisputed championship after dethroning Muhammad Ali, to 1988, when Mike Tyson finished off the remnants of the era by squashing Larry Holmes and Michael Spinks, is seen as a dark and forgettable age. Now, we've got a lot to cover. From the void left by Muhammad Ali, to the disdain for Larry Holmes, to the various champions caused by growing political affairs in the sport, to Don King's iron grip on boxing, to the rise of two new sanctioning bodies, to the division being overshadowed by the Fab Five rivalries to the sport-wide changes in rules and regulation, to the heavyweight unification tournament, to the rise and fall of Iron Mike, and to the fates of the would-be greats who slipped between the cracks. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Lost Generation. We'll start by addressing the shadow that Muhammad Ali left on the sport as a whole, and how impossibly unfair this was, in particular, for the great Larry Holmes. Muhammad Ali needs no introduction. He's worldwide, even more so after his death. Now imagine his presence just after his retirement. Boxing was in need of a new face, an ambassador, who would carry the sport going forward. But there was one gaping problem. Following up, Muhammad Ali looked to be impossible. 
I covered the shadow champs across heavyweight history and the impact of Muhammad Ali around the world cast a shadow so heavy that it could even swallow that of the other people's champions before and after his time. The world just wasn't ready to let the greatest go, but they would have to. No one filled the attitude and role better of get over it, so what, than Ali's protege. The Big Black Cloud, the Eastern Assassin, the WBC Heavyweight Champion of the World, Larry Holmes. He spent the 70s as Ali's sparring partner, learning directly from the greatest, before making his own name with his 1978 wins over Ernie Shavers and Ken Norton respectively, with the Norton victory being one of the greatest championship bouts of all time. On the subject of his win over Norton, despite it being won for the ages and Larry's big moment, the boxing world remained fixated on the impending rematch between Ali and Spinks in hopes that their hero would defy the odds and become the only ever three-time heavyweight champion. He did just that. Larry's moment was snuffed just like that. Ali held on to the WBA title for a while before announcing his retirement the following year, despite Larry insisting that he either fight for unification or retire. It was gone. No way to force the fans to love him by beating the greatest, or some thought. Ali came out of retirement in 1980 to attempt winning the title a fourth time against Holmes, and Larry seized the moment. It was no contest, as Holmes battered the people's champion. But this event actually turned the people on him further as he sank deeper into Ali's shadow. It even sparked a young heavyweight who would soon make waves on the division in his quest to get revenge for his idol, Ali. So now what? He won the title himself from Ali's kryptonite. No respect. He beat the man himself, the greatest of all time. No respect. Only thing left to do was keep on fighting, and keep fighting he did. Larry accumulated 20 title defenses over the next five years against solid competition and acted as the benchmark for an entire sanctioning body's claim to legitimacy. Some claim Larry's dominance was against less than stellar opposition, and to an extent this is true when you compare his time to that of the 70s or the 90s. But how was he to control this? The best we can ever ask of any fighter is to fight the best of their time, and he did that. Here's a brief outline of those he beat that I feel earned the spotlight, not including those from before the Ali fight like Mike Weaver and Ernie Shavers. Trevor Burbick would go on to become a champion and have retired Ali. The dropkick worthy bad blood between he and Larry culminated in a unanimous decision win for the champ. Neon Leon Spinks dethroned Ali in 1978 and had a bit more clout than Larry at the time for merely being directly involved with Ali. Holmes easily dispatched the ex-champ when they met in 1981. Mr. Ronaldo Snipes was undefeated and even knocked Larry down in the seventh round of their bout before the Easton assassin stormed back to stop Snipes in the 11th. Bad blood ensued in the interviews as Snipes felt the bout was stopped too soon and that Holmes benefited from a long count when he was down. He continued on against the who's who of the division to minor success. Gentleman Jerry Cooney was undefeated and fast-tracked to the main event while being forced into the role of the Great White Hope by boxing promotion and fans, something even Ali never had to deal with. President Reagan had a phone ready to congratulate Cooney if he won, and Larry was introduced first despite being the champion. 
Larry derailed the Cooney hype train in a gallant display from both men, and Jerry never recovered from this loss, as his career never again reached such heights. Terrible Tim Witherspoon acted as the Ken Norton of sorts to Larry, standing toe-to-toe -to -toe boxing ability-wise and giving Larry one of the toughest bouts of his career. Many felt that Witherspoon had earned the win, and Holmes appeared more human than ever. At the end of 1983, Larry relinquished the WBC title over a financial dispute regarding his payday from a fight with his mandatory, the Louisville Rage, or as he was known at the time, Sensational Greg Page. James Bone Crusher Smith was on a 14-fight win streak and gave Frank Bruno his first loss. Larry took the fight for the money and came in three weeks after a hemorrhoid operation. Despite some stiff blows and a bad cut, Larry persevered to stop Smith on cuts. Carl, the truth, Williams, was undefeated and like Witherspoon, fought arguably the best fight of his career against the aging Easton assassin. This may be the most beat up Larry was after a fight too. Williams, the crowd, and many onlookers felt he should have won. Larry scored a big win here, especially considering he took the fight on three weeks notice. The now 35-year-old champion was one win away from a historical milestone that was certainly forced the boxing public to properly acknowledge him. Rocky Marciano's 49-0 undefeated record. His 21st title defense would be against undefeated, undisputed, light heavyweight champion Michael Jinx. Spinks. In the build up to the fight, the Marciano legacy was highlighted well with the Rock's family getting involved. During training, Larry discovered he had a spinal injury linked to his right arm and he noticeably held back the right hand during the bout. Spinks scored an upset over Holmes and was the new IBF and lineal champion. 48 and 1. Just one short. Larry got into it with Rocky Marciano's brother in a very controversial post-fight interview where he spoke his mind in regards to his exploits compared to those of Rocky's. It only worsened his image. Not only was he still in Ali's shadow, but he had permanently ensured he would be in Marciano's shadow with his comments and the loss for the tie. Larry lost the rematch to Spinks in greater controversy than the first bout and stepped away for two years. When he returned, the young heavyweight that he'd angered nine years earlier with his battering of Ali had fulfilled his destiny and became the baddest man on the planet. Iron Mike Tyson had sent shockwaves through boxing with his knockout power and skill. So now, a third shadow had emerged as the boxing public adored Tyson and still detested the now 38-year-old ex-champion. Tyson became the only man to ever knock out Holmes and made good on his promise to Muhammad Ali, who was present and allegedly reminded Tyson before the fight began to get him for me. This concluded Larry's career in the 1980s. 48 straight wins, 20 title defenses, fought the best with no excuses to boot despite fighting while hurt. He's a shining example of a world-class champion, but never got his just dues because he didn't fit the image expected of a heavyweight champion. He returned in the 90s to decent success and finally gained some love with his upset over Ray Mercer and good showing against Evander Holyfield. The modern day has seen Larry Holmes finally gather some of the love and prestige he so rightfully earned, and I plan on continuing to push for this myself. Larry Holmes is one of the greatest, if not the greatest heavyweight champion of all time. One last note. 
The first bout between Holmes and Spinks was also significant in that it was another chapter in the history of heavyweight and light heavyweight champions locking horns. Spinks became the first man to accomplish the uncharted impossible of winning the heavyweight title while still reigning as light heavyweight champion. Even Archie Moore and Bob Foster couldn't pull that off. For a full timeline of heavyweight champs versus light heavyweight champs, see my video linked below. Speaking of said video, check it out along with the Shadow Champs and Larry Holmes editions of Best Career Year. The World Boxing Council and the World Boxing Association had long dominated the world of boxing. Ridiculous sanctioning fees, questionable fighter rankings, and selective rule enforcement were just a few of the reasons others had grown tired of the death grip held by the big two. The 1977 Ring Magazine scandal born from Don King's United States tournament served to increase the influence of the big two by forcing the networks to go with their rankings over that of the more grounded Ring Magazine rankings. Now, whether this was deliberate on King's part is up for debate, but it certainly helped strengthen his grip on the sport. I'll cover this specific event in a video and I'll link it in the description of this video when it's posted down the line. In 1976, the USBA, a regional body akin to the NABF, was formed to provide a base for boxing in the United States. The USBA was, originally, a springboard toward WBA rankings for fighters on the come up. In 1983, the members of the body voted to expand internationally, led by Robert W. Lee Sr., who had failed to secure the presidency of the WBA. The organization was called the United States Boxing Association International, or USBAI, before being renamed to the International Boxing Federation, or IBF, in 1984. The IBF sought to grant greater opportunity to both fighters and promoters on the come up. It recognized already established fighters as its champions, however, in its bid to gain legitimacy. In 1983, Marvelous Marvin Hagler couldn't come to an agreement with the WBC and WBA over his title defense and instead fought for the then USBAI title. This got the ball rolling big. Larry Holmes, upon refusing to defend the WBC title against Greg Page, became the IBF's path to full-scale legitimacy when he was made their champion. He would defend the title successfully up until he was outpointed by Michael Spinks in 1985, the proven best light heavyweight of the decade who would bring further merit to the title. The World Boxing Organization, which would form in 1988, went about its origin in a slightly different manner. It came about over rule disputes at a WBA convention. In an effort to gain early recognition, the WBA sanctioned a super middleweight title bout in which Thomas Hearns would emerge its inaugural champion. It did not appoint already established champions to be its title holders. If it had of, in the case of undisputed champion Mike Tyson in 1988, it may have found itself legit from the go. Instead, it sanctioned a fight between rather unknown heavyweights, of which Francesco Damiani would emerge as the inaugural champion. This may have initially doomed the WBO as, despite the array of champs that held their titles, they struggled to find recognition as a fourth sanctioning body until more than a decade after their inception. Perhaps complicating the journey of the new bodies further was the omnipresence of Don King and his influence within the WBC and the WBA. With Don King's domination also came the rise of rival promoters like Bob Arum. King and Arum in particular have been involved in a series of scandals revolving around their alleged influence within the sanctioning bodies. King's fighters have notoriously been granted the most opportunity while those otherwise are shut out. 
Remember when the WBC stripped Leon Spinks because he chose to rematch Muhammad Ali as opposed to facing Don King fighter Ken Norton? And how the vacant strap would be contested between Norton and likewise Don King fighter Larry Holmes? Remember how the WBC shafted Lennox Lewis in 1996 for the recently returned Mike Tyson? How about when the WBA stripped George Foreman in 1995 for refusing his so-called mandatory and Don King fighter Tony Tucker, who hadn't fought a ranked contender in years? Foreman made it clear he had no intentions in dealing with King. Tucker would fight for the vacant title against likewise Don King fighter Bruce Selden, who would go on to have the embarrassing showcase against the recently returned Mike Tyson, who himself was bumped up the rankings as a Don King fighter. Aram's corruption boils down to the payoffs, of which I won't dive into in this video at least. His 40 plus year rivalry with Don King may have began when he stole Muhammad Ali from him. Speaking of said rivalry, King's quest for revenge is what unfolded through the ravaging of the heavyweight division. If you weren't fighting for and under the rule of Don King, you would forever be in division obscurity. King's rule over the division became too much even for the puppet master himself in 1986 when he grew tired of the splintered and torn heavyweight scene. Now, not only were the sanctioning bodies constantly at war, so were the promoters. This mosh pit of complications ensured the death of the dream match era, as money, politics, and corporate interest became boxing's main priorities over fan interests. Add to that that the growing list of corruption from each sanctioning body, old and new. Bribes, new belts, and new weight divisions all at the dismay of the sport. This is, sadly, still reality today. And what are the prospect of unification? Well, it's common knowledge that unification is dreaded by the bodies, probably because of the financial loss that naturally comes with it. In the 90s, WBC champs weren't even allowed to unify with WBO champs. That's as blatant as it gets. Well, at least it's dreaded until the moneymaker deems it okay. When Don King recognized the fledgling interest in the sport due to the shenanigans of the time, he approached HBO with the proposition of unifying the three titles. More on that event in episode 6. Neon Leon Spinks was the last undisputed heavyweight champion after his upset over Muhammad Ali in 1978. He was immediately stripped by the WBC for refusing to fight his mandatory, but it may have been deeper than that. Spinks' mandatory was Ken Norton, a Don King fighter, and quiet as it was kept, there was a silent narrative to get the title off the aging Ali and move on from the iron grip he had on the sport. Spinks choosing to rematch Ali must have been a real slap in the face of the alleged collusion between King and the WBC. In return, they spit in his face, allegedly, of course, by granting Norton the title without the need to win it via a fight. The WBC insisted that Norton was made champion by a retroactive decision dating back to him beating Jimmy Young. Whatever the case, Norton and another Don King fighter Larry Holmes went on to have one of the greatest heavyweight title bouts of all time. From here, the WBC title saw stability in the reign of Holmes up until he was stripped of the title over financial reasons for refusing to fight Greg Page. Holmes would turn his attention to the relatively new sanctioning body, IBF, and become its inaugural champion, immediately skyrocketing its credibility. He would defend the title three times before dropping it to Michael Spinks in 1985. Spinks would win the rematch and host a successful defense against Jerry Cooney before being stripped for refusing to fight mandatory Tony Tucker. Tucker would win the vacant strap in a tough 10 round TKO over James Buster Douglas. 
three months later, he would run into the 1980s heavyweight of destiny and give him his toughest fight. But what of the WBA title? It saw the opposite of stability, as a different man held it almost every year up until 1986. The lineage from Spinks is as follows. Ali would win it back from Spinks and retire the next year. The vacant title was then decided by a four-man tournament of which Big John Tate would be the winner in the final notable bout of the 1970s. Tate would go on to lose the title in a late shocker against Mike Hercules Weaver in 1980. Weaver would go on to lose the title to Michael Dynamite Dokes in 1982. Dokes would fall to Jerry Katsia in 1983. Kate would drop the strap to Greg Page in 1984. Page would lose to Tony Tubbs in 1985. And in 1986, Terrible Tim Witherspoon would take the title from Tubbs and lose it later in the year to James Bone Crusher Smith. For whatever reason, Unification was never achieved in this seven-year span, but most observers knew deep down, whether they liked the shadow champion or not, that Larry Holmes was the best of the best. He was the spiritual undisputed champion, at least until the heavyweight World Series would play host to the birth of boxing's newest megastar and face, the man to finally succeed, Muhammad Ali, in the hearts of the fans. Oh, and as mentioned earlier, Francesco Damiani became the inaugural WBO champion in 1989. He held the title until 1991, when merciless Ray Mercer broke his nose for the knockout. Don King is alleged to have stiffed many fighters on their financial earnings. By 1983, his monopoly on the division included both titleists, and most contenders, of which was a growing list. He ensured he'd walk in and out with the winner, regardless of the fight result. His supposed dictatorship meant the fighters moved according to his wishes, like pawns in a game. They trained, did publicity, fought, and got paid as Don demanded. Allegedly. Don had his own version of professional wrestling here, writing the whole damn show. The following is a speed round of the major alleged victims from the 80s heavyweight division alone. After splitting with Don in 1983, Larry Holmes took to focusing on making up money as opposed to competition and openly said he wasn't interested in, nor did he need a unification bout. Him saying that only the public wanted such a thing only served to further diminish his reputation. His chasing of the green shaped his decision to accept the IBF title, leading to its legitimacy. After benefiting from King treatment by losing his title and getting a shot at the other, Terrible Tim Witherspoon was allegedly stiffed of 50% of his money. His next fight saw his purse go from $500,000 to $90,000, allegedly. Not a man on this planet would be motivated to work his hardest while feeling like a slave, and Witherspoon can't be blamed for falling off. His physique became more flabby with each fight, culminating in his being obliterated by Bone Crusher Smith in his next bout. Tim couldn't be bothered to care about anything else other than his relief that he was rid of Don King. He sued the promoter for $25 million shortly after and would never again receive a title shot. Before he signed with King, Pinklin Thomas never even sniffed the title scene, despite his perfect record. After losing in his first defense, Thomas lost himself in drugs before beating his addiction at the turn of the decade. Of course, King was nowhere to be found when his former champion needed him most. Dynamite Dokes looked up to Don King like a father, but was treated like a stepchild when he found himself in trouble with the IRS. King, with his visible assets of a mansion and millions of dollars, turned Dokes away. Dokes, among the trouble he would get into, became suicidal. 
As with Terrible Tim, Greg Page's physique could be spotted flabbing out during his championship tenure under King. He admitted to buying a gun just to empty its clip into King. Page had a tragic ending to be covered in Part 7, and during the final stretch of his life unable to talk, Page scribbled on paper that Don King stole all of his money. Among the five listed were also Leon Spinks, Trevor Burbick, Bone Crusher Smith, Tex Cobb, Tony Tubbs, Mike Tyson, and Muhammad Ali himself. Tyson's war with King occurred more so in the 90s and Ali's more so in the 70s. Don King has been the subject of many allegations, but nothing has ever really stuck. Is he a crook or is he misunderstood as the scapegoat for the bad choices of the generation? Believe what you choose. Ultimately, Mike Tyson vanquished King's pawns and became the Monopoly. Logically, King moved in on Kid Dynamite, and the rest is history. With such confusion afoot, it may have become easier to welcome the dismissal of boxing as a sport. On November 13, 1982, Ray Mancini and Duk Ku Kim had a brutal war that ended with a 14-round referee stoppage in favor of Mancini. Kim fell into a coma and died from his injuries four days later. Kim's mother committed suicide in January of 1983. Referee Richard Green committed suicide in July. Kim left behind a pregnant girlfriend who birthed their son in July of 1983. Mancini went into depression, shouldering the burden of the tragedy, and was never really the same afterward. This one fight was the straw that broke the camel's back after the various tragedies that befell the sweet science over the years. The Nevada State Athletic Commission implemented the standing eight count, which allows the referee to stop the action and begin a count if a boxer appears to be in too much trouble. Fighters who were knocked out were put on a 45-day suspension before they could compete again. In 1982, the WBC announced that its sanctioned bouts would now have a 12-round limit as opposed to 15 rounds. The WBA and IBF followed suit in 1987. In 1988, the WBO debuted with the 12-round limit in place. Pre-fight medical tests have also become more strict. Kim, who was largely unknown at the time of the bout, has left an inevitable mark on the sport in that fans have grown to better appreciate boxers for their skill and courage as opposed to clamoring for barbaric slugfest. May the fallen champion, his mother, and the referee rest in peace. May Ray Boom Boom Mancini continue to find peace. May all those affected continue on strong. Despite these reforms being a positive for the health and safety of fighters, fight fans have continued to gradually fall off from the sport as the combination of questionable business and the lower entertainment value take effect. Though most are used to the new 12-round championship limit, some clamor for the return of 15-round bouts. If the sanctioning bodies truly care for the Warriors, why are there still limited plans in place for those at the end of their careers with nothing to show for it? Fighters like Floyd Mayweather Jr. have recognized and prepared properly for this, all while being labeled as boring cherry pickers by the public. It's a slippery slope, but the bottom line is that boxing needs to get to work on bringing about a lone, unified body of recognition. It's far past overdue. In a way, this was the death of prize fighting. It may not have been banned, but it certainly began the lost appeal in the public eye seen today, as sports fans have gravitated more toward mixed martial arts. Next, we'll take a look at the lower decks of the 1980s boxing scene and see how they overtook 
the marquee division by emulating the draw of the 70s heavyweights. Politics. No clear face of the division, a lower quality championship picture. These problems alone caused waning interest in the heavyweight division. Making matters worse was the fact that this was a golden age of sorts for the lower weight classes, highlighted in particular by the Fab Five rivalries. Wilfred Benitez, Roberto Duran, Marvin Hagler, Thomas Hearns, Ray Leonard. Almost all five of these warriors fought in some combination. They dominated the 80s and left the withered heavyweight division looking like even more of a shell of its former glory. Beyond their five-way rivalry, they beat some other good notable names during this period too, but we'll mostly be focusing on the big five. To service my point, the following is a timeline of the Fab Five rivalries. Roberto Duran appeared in Rocky II as a lightning-fast sparring partner for Rocky in his training for the Apollo Creed rematch. I'll admit that before researching and writing for this timeline, I had no idea that was Duran. It's also worth noting that one of Duran's nicknames during his 70s lightweight career was Rocky. I include this point to stress how the pendulum have shifted Instead of the heavyweights getting the film honor, as they had in the first Rocky with Joe Frazier's cameo, the lower weight classes were sought out. On the undercard of this event, Marvin Hagler drew with Vito Antofermo in his first bid for the middleweight title. It was seen as a blatant robbery. Hagler would beat Antofermo two years later by fifth round technical knockout to retain his middleweight title in what would be his second defense. The main event of the evening saw the unknown beginning of the Fab Five rivalries. El Radar, Wilfred Benitez was a two division world champion at just 21 years old and the youngest champion in the history of the sport, having captured the light welterweight title at the age of 17, a record he still holds. Sugar Ray Leonard was a 1976 Olympic gold medalist who was undefeated in 27 bouts. Something had to give. Over the course of 15 rounds, Leonard managed to outpoint the aggressive Benitez, knocking him down with a jab in the third. In the 15th, with about 30 seconds to go, Leonard decked Benitez with an uppercut of which the champion would answer, though clearly hurt. With only six seconds to go, the fight was stopped, and Sugar Ray Leonard was the new welterweight champion of the world. He was ahead on all cards at the time of the stoppage. Undisputed lightweight iron champion of six years and 1970s fighter of the decade, Roberto Duran, made the move to welterweight in his bid to stamp his name further on boxing history. After eight straight wins, he emerged the number one contender in challenge champion Sugar Ray Leonard. The buildup was filled with bad blood and may have played a hand at what would unfold. The fight was a back and forth 15 round war in which Duran managed to edge out Leonard after getting him to stand toe to toe with him as opposed to his usual boxing approach. It was a narrow unanimous decision for Hands of Stone. Is it possible that Duran's psychological warfare with which he broke Leonard down planted a seed in Leonard? Of course, regarding revenge, but also the potential crossroads between himself and the soon-to-be king of the middleweights. Hmm. Speaking of the king of the middleweights. After the robbery against Antifermo, Alan Minter stepped over Hagler and beat the champion setting up this matchup between Minter and Marvin Hagler. It is alleged that Minter's contemporary, Kevin Finnegan, insisted Hagler refused to shake his hands on the grounds that he was white. Minter said he experienced the same behavior. In response, 
Minter stated that he had no plans on losing his title to a black man. But that's just what he would do when Hagler battered him for the third round stoppage. British fight fans pelted the ring with drinks, denying Hagler his big moment. It was a classless moment, but Hagler reacted with grace and remained optimistic in the face of hatred. Hagler also clarified that it wasn't a race thing, the not shaking hands debacle. He never shook hands with any man he might fight in the future. Minter also clarified that he said he'd never lose to that black man, not a black man. Even after toppling the middleweight world, Marvin was cast into the shadows by the fans and looked to have little hope of ever matching the popularity of golden boy Sugar Ray Leonard. Originally billed as the Super Fight, Ray Leonard immediately challenged his conqueror Roberto Duran to a rematch. This time around, Leonard utilized his superior speed and boxed Duran at range, flustering the champion. In the seventh, Leonard grew so confident in his execution that he began taunting the champion, winding up bolo punches and all. Near the end of the eighth, Duran turned his back to Leonard and waved him off. Leonard took advantage and struck twice. Duran refused to fight back. Leonard celebrated and the ref called him back to fight. As Leonard prepped to re-engage, Duran once again waved off Leonard and retreated to his corner. Leonard went into a frenzy of celebration at the sight of Duran quitting. What Duran said depends on who you ask. Most will remember Duran stating, no mas, which means no more. Duran himself says he never said that, but rather that he said, no sigo, meaning, I'm not carrying on, alluding to Leonard's foolery in the last two rounds. Whatever the case, the fight was retroactively deemed the no mas fight, and Leonard took great pride in letting everyone know he made Hands of Stone quit. The Showdown for Welterweight Unification With the Duran saga behind him, Sugar Ray Leonard was open to rumble with the undefeated Motor City Cobra, Thomas Hearns. It was a shifting war seeing both men take the initiative. Hearns' size troubled Leonard initially, but Leonard stormed back to batter Hearns in the 6th and 7th. The hitman regrouped and started piling up the points again. Whereas the fight started with Hearns stalking Leonard, it was now the inverse. Heading into the 13th, Angelo Dundee uttered the now iconic You're blowing it now, son. You're blowing it. Leonard exploded on Hearns in the 13th with two knockdowns, the first of which sent Hearns through the ropes. In the 14th, Sugar Ray stayed on the hunt and stopped Tommy after pinning him to the ropes. Sugar Ray Leonard was the new unified welterweight champion having stormed back while down on all three cards. The bout was named Fight of the Year and Sugar Ray Fighter of the Year. Controversy ensued regarding the scoring in the stoppage. It would be eight years before Tommy would get his shot at knocking Leonard out to settle the score. A long eight years. No one could possibly know it at the time, but the last great performance from one of these men was on deck. WBC light middleweight champion Wilfred Benitez welcomed the challenge of the tarnished legend Roberto Duran. Duran was looking to recover big from the embarrassing loss to Sugar Ray and saw a victory over Benitez as the springboard he needed toward a rubber match with Leonard. The Bible of Boxing turned in what may be the finest performance of his career as he befuddled Duran, beating him to the punch over 15 rounds. Duran waved Benitez off at the final bell knowing he'd been beaten. The judges agreed, awarding a unanimous decision to the champion, though it was closer on the cards than would be expected from Benitez's sensational performance. In the post-fight interview, Benitez made it clear that this fight was merely a stepping stone in his mind toward a middleweight clash with Marvin Hagler in which he'd seek to win his fourth world title in a different division. 
After a third round knockout of Bruce Finch to defend the unified title, Ray noticed in training for his next bout against Roger Stafford that he was seeing eye floaters. Turns out he had a detached retina, which was surgically repaired on May 9th of 1982. On November 9th of 1982, Leonard invited the boxing world to a charity event in which he'd announce whether his career would continue. Marvin Hagler was chief among those present, and Ray acknowledged a fight between the two would be incredible, but that it would never happen. Ray admitted his eye was healed, he just didn't want to box anymore. It had to be a real slap in the face to Hagler, who was stuck in the shadow of Leonard and looking for his own time in the limelight. He was denied his biggest payday and a chance to beat the Golden Boy, all because Leonard didn't feel like it. Well, Leonard got the feeling back in December of 1983 and announced his return. He would have another eye surgery to fix a loose retina before a bout against Kevin Howard on May 11, 1984. In said bout, with Hagler in attendance, mind you, Leonard was dropped for the first time in his career and stormed back to stop his opponent in the ninth. In the post-fight, Leonard once again announced his retirement this time saying it was because he just didn't have what it took to fight anymore. It's also worth noting that a narrative brewed around Leonard regarding the dangers of him fighting with a questionable eye. All according to plan. <laughs> Fed up with network producers refusing to call him by his moniker of Marvelous, which was compounded by them doing so for fighters like William Caveman Lee, Marvin Nathaniel Hagler had his name legally changed to Marvelous Marvin Hagler. The world will surely never forget his nickname now. Henceforth, Hagler will be referred to as such in full when need be in this timeline. It's also worth noting that the boxing world was forecasting Hagler to fight Hearns, Benitez, and Leonard in the near future. Instead of moving up to 160 for a chance at the Hagler dream bout, Benitez chose to clash with the Motor City Cobra in a super fight. Both men had been defiled by Sugar Ray Leonard and were looking for revenge bouts against him. The stare down is the thumbnail for intensity. Hearns managed to drop Benitez in the fifth with a right and suffered a phantom knockdown of his own in the ninth after Wilfred stepped on his foot. Outside of these knockdowns, Hearns added to his reputation on the night by outboxing Benitez when he was better known as a guy who could get you out of there with a bang. He hurt his right hand around the eighth round and stuck to his left for the majority of the fight. Tommy was awarded a majority decision. A bit of background before we move on. This bout was originally scheduled for February 23rd of 1981 on a supercar billed as This Is It, but promoter Harold Smith, real name Ross Fields, got caught up in charges of embezzlement and fraud of which he would be sentenced to 10 years in prison. Relative to the Four Kings, Benitez's career fizzles out from here and he was never able to secure the now historically coveted bout against marvelous Marvin Hagler. Five months earlier, Roberto Duran finally escaped the cloud of the Nomas fight when he stopped Davey Moore for the WBA junior middleweight title. He now had a golden opportunity to propel himself to heights beyond that of retired rival Sugar Ray Leonard, a natural lightweight king stepping up to face the undisputed middleweight king. The Duranimal looked to further showcase his greatness against the toughest man on the block and he did just that. The fight turned out to be quite tactical, the opposite of what was expected from the two warriors. Duran fought from the outside as opposed to his usual inside mastery, and Hagler bided his time as an opportunist looking to strike during prime openings. It was a very close bout that Duran was winning by the 13th, but Hagler seized the final two rounds and secured the unanimous decision. Hagler won the fight by a razor-thin margin of one point, and it was the first time that he'd been taken the distance as champion following seven straight knockout defenses. 
Now, what of a rematch? Duran claimed that Hagler promised him a rematch, but it never came to pass. Duran claims he also had Hagler figured out and certainly would have won the rematch. Maybe he would have. Maybe Hagler would have been better prepared. Also, was Duran robbed? And should he have ascended in legend further by being crowned undisputed middleweight king? His fans certainly say so, akin to Hagler's fans when it comes to a fight four years to come in this timeline. The sad reality of time is that we'll never truly know any of these answers. Duran opted to move back down to super welterweight, of which he was still its WBA champion, and vacated said title in favor of fighting Tommy Hearns over his mandatory Mike McCallum. Despite this, most fans felt that this bout was still the determining factor over who the true 154-pound champion was. Unification in spirit. In a direct turnaround from Duran's showcase against Hagler, he was dominated by Hearns before being knocked spark out in the second. Duran was floored twice in the first round before his demise in the second. The physical attributes of the Motor City Cobra proved too much a task for Duran to overcome. Originally promoted as The Fight and now retroactively known as The War, Marvelous Marvin Hagler and Tommy Hitman Hearns engaged in a slugfest that rivals Foreman Lyle as the most exciting fight of all time. The bout was supposed to happen in 1982, but injuries got in the way before the dust settled in 1985. The build-up saw the normally stoic Hearns have to take the initiative and hype the press conferences, as Marvelous Marvin never was too talkative outside of his in-ring action. On fight night, Hearns had a massage before the bout, a decision that is believed by Emmanuel Stewart to have cost him his legs. When the bell rang for round one, Hagler stormed out instead of starting slow as was his usual. For what has since gone down as the greatest round in boxing history, Hagler and Hearns traded non-stop power punches. Hagler suffered a bad cut on the forehead and Hearns broke his right hand. Recall that he hurt his hand against Benitez too, but still managed to pull out the win. The round ended with Hagler hurting Hearns. Hearns was given the round by two judges. The second was slower, with Hagler experimenting as Hearns remained on rubbery legs. This time, Hagler took the round on two of the judges' scorecards. In the third and final round, Hagler returned to his first round aggression as Hearns continued trying to set the pace with his jab. Hagler's cut had worsened and he wanted to avoid a stoppage. Hagler pounded on the punishment and finished Hearns. You have to see the final volley for yourself, with Hagler smashing in an overhand left that rocked Hearns, Hearns smiling to fake as if the blow didn't hurt, Hagler dishing a right hook that sent Hearns to the ropes, Hagler pursuing to finish Hearns with a right and two extra uppercuts, and Hearns timbering to the canvas. Sugar Ray Leonard, who was a common face at Hagler bouts, did well in his calling of the action. Hagler was carried around in victory, soaked in his own blood. Hearns was carried back to his corner, obviously not all the way alert from the war. The fight proved to be Hagler's breakthrough, with the boxing public finally catapulting him into the limelight that once belonged to the now-retired Sugar Ray Leonard. The Golden Boy appeared to notice this, and put his plans back into action. The next year in March, Hagler would have a notable bout against John the Beast Mugabe and win by 11th round knockout. Sugar Ray Leonard was in attendance and observed the difficulty that Mugabe caused the slowing Hagler. He wanted Hagler, but the champion was considering retirement until having a last minute change of heart. Negotiations ensued in the summer for the proposed super bout between Hagler and Leonard. After many years of fan interest, 
the super fight was on. In 1986, Sugar Ray Leonard agreed to come out of retirement only for a bout against undisputed middleweight champion Marvelous Marvin Hagler. Hagler took his turn to play games with Leonard and held out as he pondered retirement with nothing left to prove. Ultimately, the champion decided to have one last match and finally squash the Golden Boy before riding off into the sunset. After stiff negotiations and some politics from the sanctioning bodies, Hagler and Leonard were set to fight for the Lineal, Ring, and WBC titles. The WBA stripped Marvin and the IBF refused to sanction, but stated Hagler would be stripped if he lost. In one of the most controversial and polarizing fights in boxing history, Ray Leonard emerged with a split decision over Marvelous Marvin Hagler. Hagler says Leonard admitted to him in the ring that he beat him, but Ray denied this. Hagler wanted a rematch, but Leonard retired again, as he stated he would beforehand. Beyond the outcome, Leonard's demands for the fight conditions, apparent patient wait for Hagler to slow down, and deceiving Hagler into fighting his fight are still held against him. In hindsight, Leonard's alleged near-decade-long showcase of mind games, baiting and switching, engineering of narratives, and exploitation of his stardom were nothing short of a master class in war. He broke Hagler down over the course of time and strategically waited for the perfect time to strike. The you-almost-had-it taunts of a potential fight the eye narrative to make himself more an underdog, the time off to push that he lost a step, the attending and calling of Hagler's bouts, the daring of Hagler to accept his long overdue challenge, getting the champion to agree to his conditions as challenger and therefore establishing that he himself was mentally still the people's champion, the bending of Hagler during the fight to fight his fight, frustrating the champion and taking advantage of his flash to steal rounds. Knowing he could exploit a close score on the cards when Hagler had notoriously never gotten the favor of the judges in close fights, and then leaving Hagler with a rock-solid hate boner as he denied him a rematch. Could it be that Sugar Ray Leonard orchestrated a beatdown even greater than that of Muhammad Ali's over George Foreman. Eh, it's all conspiracy at the end of the day, but damn, what a series of events. The debate will forever ensue on the meaning of this all, whether Leonard was the best for his plotting or whether Hagler was the best for needing such plotting to be dethroned. Hagler eventually grew tired of waiting for a rematch and retired to a career of acting and celebrity in Italy. It was then that Leonard offered him the rematch. But Hagler had moved on. It was Leonard's last match with career-long trainer Angelo Dundee due to financial woes. A rematch eight years in the making, now at Super Middleweight. WBC champion Sugar Ray Leonard and WBO champion Tommy Hearns fought to a disputed draw, as most had Hearns winning by a good enough margin. The hitman dropped Leonard in the third and the eleventh, Sugar Ray had a big enough round five to secure the 10-8 score. The Warriors both left with their belts. It's also worth noting that Tommy's brother was arrested for shooting his girlfriend to death on the day of the fight, and this may have been on the heart of the hitman. This is another one of those fights that fight fans use in the criticism of Leonard's career. Ray has since publicly admitted that Hearns won this fight, which really has to sting marvelous Marvin Hagler, who Ray didn't grant the same honor. For most, this is the last to rob the Fab Five rivalries, but we've still got one more to go to end the great story just right. Just uno mas. Regardless of how overdue it was, one last time, one last fight to close this short timeline and seal off the Fab Five rivalries. Leonard was the WBC super middleweight champion. Duran was the WBC middleweight champion. Having upset Iran Barkley to fulfill the dream he may have been robbed of six years earlier against marvelous Marvin Hagler. 
only Leonard's title was on the line. It was a lopsided 12-round decision for Sugar Ray Leonard in his trilogy win over Hands of Stone. Leonard would relinquish his title the next year and only fight twice more. Duran fought until 2001, completing a career spanning five different decades. The rivalries ended almost where they had started, with Leonard and Duran both opening and closing the 1980s. They forged a friendship that thrives to this day. With how exciting and organized that all was, can you see why the heavyweight division struggled to keep up? Boxing's marquee division found itself on the undercard of the Fab Five rivalries. Just a perfect storm for the fall off. Is it also safe to say the other four kings suffered as shadow champs in the wake of Sugar Ray Leonard? Benitez lost his zero to Leonard and fizzled out soon after, losing his claim to being in the Club of the Kings. Duran's embarrassing of Leonard was upstaged and he lost the trilogy. Hearns lost his O to Leonard and it can be argued he was robbed of his retribution in the rematch after eight years of simmering revenge. Hagler, worst of all, was in the shadow of them all and beat them all to escape, but he fell into the narrative of Sugar Ray being the triumphant protagonist. Of course, time has been kind to their legacies but Sugar Ray still looms ever so subtly. Let's deliberate on a potential bout between Benitez and Hagler. Recall the triangle theory and how it's never to be trusted in boxing. Frazier beat Ali, Foreman destroyed Frazier, and everyone expected the same fate for Ali, but he shocked Foreman. In the case of the Fab Five, you could play the same game. Duran beat Leonard, who beat Benitez. So Duran should beat Benitez too, right? Wrong, he was masterclassed by Benitez. Benitez beat Duran, who lost to Hearns. Hearns did end up beating Benitez too. Hagler was pushed to his limits by Duran, and Duran was decimated by Hearns. So we should expect Hearns to destroy Hagler too, correct? Not to be, as Hagler was the one who eviscerated Hearns through adversity. Benitez put on a clinic against Duran, who himself gave Hagler his toughest title fight up to that point. But history tells us that doesn't guarantee Benitez would have won. Benitez was outboxed by knockout artist Hearns and was also outlasted by Sugar Ray Leonard. Leonard saw Hagler as such a threat that he waited him out for a prime chance at a win. Uh, allegedly. Still, this does not guarantee Hagler wins. Triangle theory goes both ways and is unreliable in determining dream matches. Styles make fights, and who knows what factors would come into play on fight night. Hagler struggled more so against outside masterful boxers, a bill of which Benitez fits. On the other hand, Benitez struggled in his training and dedication to the sport, making him very inconsistent. He could box on the outside, but also liked his comfort zone in corners where he would squabble on the inside. The inside was so dangerous a place to go with Hagler that even Duran, with his sticky hand strat, wagered to keep outside. Does Benitez frustrate Hagler for the points win? Or does Hagler catch him on the inside after breaking him down? All that being said, if the fight happens after the Benitez-Duran fight somewhere around late 1982 or early 1983, I'd put my money on Hagler. He hadn't lost a step yet and Benitez never regained top form after the Duran win. Hagler gets the win by a late stoppage somewhere in the championship rounds. This episode of Boxingpedia is dedicated to the Fab Five, not just four, but five as El Radar isn't to be overlooked. Perhaps he has been denied a crown due to his sloppy training and not exactly living up to his potential. In the case of the Fab Five, he's the long lost king, akin to the entire generation of heavyweights above him. Even so, it can't be denied that he left his impact on the era, is just as accomplished as the others, and was just as special as the known four kings. Sugar Ray himself included Benitez in the bunch when he acknowledged how fortunate he was to have the rivals he did 
in his quest for greatness. Now, no need to rank the five. Let's just appreciate them. So what are the five kings up to today? Wilfred Benitez retired in 1990 due to failing health from an incurable degenerative brain condition caused by the punishment he took in his boxing career. His health has worsened since, though he has recovered a bit as recent as 2018. Stay strong, champ. He was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1994. Ray Leonard retired for good in 1997 after being stopped by Hector Camacho. He was inducted into the Hall of Fame in the same year and was the 1980s Boxer of the Decade. He remains active in his post-boxing life, having done boxing commentary, charity work, and advocacy against child molestation. Roberto Duran retired in 2002 due to a car crash that required life-saving surgery. He was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2007 and is still going strong today as an ambassador for Panama's premium bottled water, Panama Blue. Thomas Hearns retired in 2006 and was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2012. He's had some financial issues and his health is questionable, what with the slurred and slowed speech, but otherwise, he's still going strong. Marvelous Marvin Hagler retired in 1987 after the debacle with Ray Leonard and moved on from chasing a rematch. He moved to Italy and became a famous actor. Unfortunately, Hagler passed away on March 13, 2021, at the age of 66, from natural causes. It caught us all off guard, and I remember being in the middle of my Twitch livestream when the news broke. The Marvelous One was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1993. Rest in peace, champ, and see you on the other side. Tune in next, where we'll chronicle another series of matches. This one in recognition that something had to give in the corruption that was the 1980s heavyweight division. It's time for a tournament. A World Series. Take me out to the Undisputed Championship. <laughs> With the five kings keeping boxing alive, boxing's marquee division needed to get back into shape and make up ground. In October of 1985, Don King and HBO determined to come together in a grand effort to restore interest in heavyweight boxing with a unification tournament. The three titles would be brought together to crown the first undisputed champion since Leon Spinks dethroned Muhammad Ali seven years earlier. Larry Holmes never unified the division, but everyone knew he was the true champion. That was until Michael Spinks dethroned him in 1985. There was nowhere left to go for the big heads of boxing, and they had to finally give the people what they wanted. One heavyweight champion. But was it too late? At the very least, they hoped that the fresh upstart, Mike Tyson, would qualify and rejuvenate interest for an otherwise lackluster slate of fights. The following is a timeline of the heavyweight World Series held between 1986 and 87, featuring bonus bouts that I see fit as worthy chapters of the saga. On January 17, 1986, at a press conference for the coming battle between terrible Tim Witherspoon and Tony TNT Tubbs, HBO and Don King announced that the WBA title bout was a prelude to the tournament as the winner would participate. After a rough, tough, and competitive 15 rounds, Witherspoon edged out a majority decision against Tubbs. Two judges had it dead even, while the third had Tim ahead by one point. 
After the fight, Terrible Tim tested positive for marijuana and was fined $25,000 while being forced to grant Tubbs a rematch. It was scheduled for December 12th of 1986. The first inning of the Heavyweight World Series saw undefeated WBC champion Pinklin Thomas take on the young Buffalo, Trevor Burbick. Burbick was a six and a half to one underdog and Thomas was favored to win the entire tournament. Burbick wore the champion down over 12 rounds with the use of his own strength and speed. He almost dropped Thomas in the 11th, but Pinklin endured. Both men showed the wounds of war in the aftermath, where Burbick was awarded a unanimous decision. In a rematch of their controversial 1985 bout, Michael Spinks and Larry Holmes fought to an even more disputed conclusion, with Spinks winning a majority decision. Holmes was thought to have won more convincingly this time, but the judges didn't see it that way. He built a strong lead in the first four rounds, but Spinks climbed back into it and edged out the win. Larry stunned Spinks in the 14th and 15th, but failed to follow up, showcasing how he was, indeed, a shell of his former self that had dominated the division since 1978. The Easton assassin claimed he would fight no more, and Michael Spinks' claim to the lineage had been stamped home. He was no fluke. On paper, at least. Three months later, Frank Bruno had a golden opportunity to end a dry spell almost as old as the century by becoming the first British heavyweight champion since Bob Fitzsimmons. The nation would have its heart broken when Bruno was stopped in the 11th round by a series of Witherspoon overhand rights. It was no easy path to the win, as Tim's face reflected the initial stalemate of strength and toughness between the two. Unified lineal IBF champion Michael Spinks stopped Norwegian challenger Steven Tangstad in four rounds. Spinks dropped his opponent once in the third and twice in the fourth. On the undercard of this event, the hopes of Mike Tyson qualifying for the tournament were fulfilled when he stopped Alfonso Ratliff in two rounds. He was now 12-0 on the year alone, having beat some solid names along the way. His 13th and final fight on the year would be for the WBC title in just over two months. The Phenom had arrived in full to execute the judgment of Trevor Burbick. Remember that Burbick retired Muhammad Ali and Tyson had his eyes on he and Holmes in his quest to avenge his hero. Kid Dynamite dominated Burbick for the longest two rounds of the champion's career, dropping him three times and bouncing him around the ring like a basketball. He became the youngest heavyweight champion ever and the Tyson hype train was in full effect. Originally, this was supposed to be the rematch of the fairly even matchup between Terrible Tim and TNT Tubbs, but Tubbs wound up pulling out a week before the fight due to a shoulder injury. Don King accused him of doing it over money. In his place, James Bone Crusher Smith stepped up a man Witherspoon had beaten by decision the previous year. Witherspoon was very displeased with Bone Crusher's substitution, citing how he trained exclusively for Tubbs and threatened to pull out himself, but Don King threatened legal action. WBC champion Mike Tyson was in attendance, knowing he would be facing the winner next. Bone Crusher took the chance to exact his revenge on Witherspoon, becoming the first man to knock him down, and almost threw the ropes at that. A second knockdown to Witherspoon cost him one of his teeth, root and all. Tim was dropped a third time, and the fight was stopped by a three-knockdown rule. It was a blowout, 
and sweet vengeance for new WBA champion Bone Crusher Smith. He'd been thrust into the title picture on a whim and seized the opportunity. There went a potential dream bout between Terrible Tim and Iron Mike, one that sadly never came to fruition. The Bone Crusher ran into hell in the form of the then billed Iron Man, Tyson. Smith would become the first man to take Mike the championship distance of 12 rounds, probably coming down to all of the holding more so than any of his own offense. The fight was booed by the crowd and is one of the most boring title fights of the era, coming down to Bone Crusher's safety first approach. Tyson earned a unanimous decision and was now the unified WBC, WBA heavyweight champion. All it took was a good deal of frustration and more action between rounds than during them. The first half of the Hard Road to Glory doubleheader was supposed to be a contest for the Lineal, Ring, and IBF titles between Michael Spinks and Tony Tucker. But Spinks opted for a big payday against Jerry Cooney and was stripped of the IBF title. Instead, Tucker would battle for the vacant IBF strap against James Buster Douglas. In an underrated back-and-forth affair, Tony Tucker managed a 10th round TKO after stunning and flurrying Douglas. He would face the winner of the night's main event in three short months for alphabet unification. In the main event, Mike Tyson engaged in his tune-up against Pinklin Thomas. He successfully defended the unified WBC WBA title by thrashing the challenger. Tyson became the first man to drop Thomas after a merciless barrage of hooks and uppercuts. Angelo Dundee, Pinklin's trainer, entered the ring to call off the action as Thomas barely rose at the count of nine. With the night in the history books, the boxing world awaited August 1st for a sight that had not been seen since September 15th, 1978. As mentioned, Michael Spinks was stripped of the IBF title for refusing to fight Tony Tucker. He went with the money fight against Jerry Cooney and retained the lineage and ring magazine recognition by fifth round stoppage after two knockdowns. The challenger had been inactive for 13 months. Cooney's career hit a wall when he lost to Larry Holmes in 1982, and this was yet another failed recovery attempt. If he had won, a dream match with Mike Tyson may have been on the horizon. The ninth inning, Mike Tyson and Tony Tucker, winner take all. In what may be the toughest win of Mike's career, he was taken the distance by a peak Tucker to secure his final piece of the alphabet pie. He was now the unified WBC, WBA, IBF champion. Officially, the tournament ends here with the belts having come together. Mike Tyson had done a seemingly impossible deed by unifying the alphabet titles only two years into his professional career. He'd taken the boxing world by storm and provided a much needed spark in the journey to reviving heavyweight boxing. The people loved him. He wasn't entirely the champ just yet. Now for the extra innings, the alphabet champ up against the Olympic gold medalist. Tyson and Biggs had history dating back to Tyson not making the Olympic team in 1984. As I've said before, Tyson shut Biggs up big time 
and taught him that you should never laugh at Kid Dynamite. It was a brilliant performance in which Mike broke down the bigger man and stopped him after two knockdowns. He looked flawless as Biggs fell apart. Not only was Tyson the holder of every belt, but he had the gold in spirit now as well. Add to this all the impressive string of wins he was putting on and you've got the true emergence of boxing's next megastar in the wake of the great Ali. This bout's inclusion comes down to the fact that it was the two best heavyweights of the 80s getting it on. Holmes the face of the first half of the decade and Tyson the latter. It was an opportunity for Mike Tyson to snatch the torch from the old lion and avenge his idol Muhammad Ali in full. He did just that in devastating fashion, becoming the only man to ever stop the Eastern assassin. There was just one more man to square away in Tyson's long road to becoming the universally recognized baddest man on the planet. Here we are, the end of the extra innings. Mike Tyson's crusade in which he garnered every alphabet title earned him a legitimate claim to the lineage. Michael Spinks was still the man who'd beaten the man. Another Ali Frazier situation in which the true heavyweight champion was to be decided. The legacy of this night branches from many points. Tyson punching holes in the wall out of impatience over Butch Lewis complaining about his hand wraps, Spinks growing more terrified as he approached the ring, and, most notable, Tyson dispatching of Spinks in just 91 seconds with eight landed punches. Spinks announced his retirement the next month, and Tyson dismissed his trainer Kevin Rooney that December. He was never the same and the night would truly go down as the pinnacle of Iron Mike's career. It was the richest fight in boxing history up to that point, surpassing even the super fight between Sugar Ray Leonard and Marvelous Marvin Hagler the previous year. The fight surpassed the 1987 Super Bowl as the highest grossing one day in sports history. The heavyweights were back helmed by a marketing and money printing machine in Mike Tyson. The narrative came out perfectly. Heavyweight boxing's apparent demise before the tournament was merely the vehicle for the rise of Muhammad Ali's true successor. Everything since 1978 was the path of Iron Mike Tyson to becoming the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world and rebirthing the marquee division as its face. It was organic, with Tyson unifying the division the hard way, one title and mark at a time, along with Tyson ending the lost generation with his conquest. Or, at least this is what they wanted us to think. Knowing how dirty the game is, it's a miracle Tyson held the belts before securing the lineage. His rise signaled the next logical question. Who's going to knock him off? Many fighters geared up for the approaching 1990s, which would go down as arguably the best decade for the division depending on who you ask. This alone is good grounds for Tyson's legacy as one of the all-time greats, but he wasn't done just yet. The Heavyweight Unification World Series was a smashing success, having featured the best names of the decade inside one bracket. With heavyweight boxing back at the forefront, where was undisputed champion Mike Tyson going to steer the ship? Or rather, where were the sanctioning bodies and Don King to do so? Before we answer that, a eulogy for the lost generation.
Cocaine is a hell of a drug, but it ain't the only drug. The party lifestyle took the forefront for our lost generation as opposed to boxing. These men, who slipped through the cracks between Ali and Tyson, fell victim to tragedy, injury, illness, financial and mental ruin among substance abuse, seductive women, slacking on training, criminal activity, and all-out addiction. The 1980s featured more names of potential prominence than the 1970s and the 1990s, but only three of the large lot managed to actually stand out. The following is The Fates of the Fallen. The Good Names That Could Have Been Great. Let's start on a positive note with the man who is the bridge itself between the golden era and the lost generation. Vanquished to the shadows of Ali, Marciano, and Tyson, he is only just now getting his just due. Life saw no controversy for Larry, akin to that of his contemporaries. The real tragedy is the unfair treatment he got while being a fighter who actually did have the drive to be great. He came back in the 90s and came close to reclaiming the title, but fell short. After boxing, Larry invested his money well and is still going strong today. He's a living legend that we must appreciate while he's here. Larry has even appeared on an episode of Mike Tyson Mysteries. He and George Foreman are our windows to a bygone era. May the big black cloud remain immortal as more come to see how great he truly was. I've mistakenly referred to Big John Tate as the first of the lost generation. Correction, it is actually Leon Spinks who donned in the new generation. His upset over Ali would turn out to be the pinnacle of his career, as he never truly learned how to compete at the championship level for the long term. The man's bodyguard was the one and only Mr. T, and even he couldn't keep the young star out of trouble. After beating Ali, Spinks was arrested seven times, Photographed, handcuffed for newspapers, crashed two of his cars, charged for speeding, and busted with cocaine. All before losing the rematch he couldn't be bothered to properly train for. He wasn't ready for the big time, but was in the fast lane. His loss in his first defense would start a bad pattern for the generation to come. He was eliminated in the WBA tournament to crown a new champ after Ali and failed to even budge Larry Holmes in their WBC contest. His health worsened over the years, his speech was badly slurred from the punishment, and he tragically passed away from prostate cancer in 2021 without much money. May Neon Leon rest in peace. Big John Tate's big moment came just two years into his career when he captured the WBA title by winning the post-Ali tournament. He had a great start to his career and was thought to be the next big thing. Unfortunately, he would follow in Leon's steps and lose in his first title defense to Mike Weaver. He had the fight won and just had to stay away but stayed and paid late in the fight, being knocked out cold by Weaver. After being knocked out by Trevor Burbick, he never came close to the title again, and his life fell apart. By the time of his retirement, he was addicted to cocaine, broke as a joke, deserted by those he once held close, had sold off his assets, and was homeless. He was also in and out of jail. He was killed in a car crash on April 9, 1998. Rest in peace to perhaps the biggest example of lost potential from the lost generation. Mike Weaver was built like a Greek god, but just a journeyman. Or so it seemed, as he had some flashes in the pen that made one rethink it all. He turned in good performances against worthy opponents, but lost to questionable opposition. His 1979 bout with Larry Holmes showcased how good he could be, and he must have noticed. As mentioned, 
He would go on to storm back and knock out John Tate in the final round of their 1980 bout after being behind on the cards. He broke the curse and defended his title twice before the controversial duology with Michael Dokes, in which he lost and failed to regain the belt. He failed to capture the WBC title against unbeaten Pinkland Thomas in 1985 and remained a measuring stick for the division up until his retirement in 2000. Another warrior who made the best of what he had, and he now lives a peaceful retirement life away from the bright lights. Keep on strong, champ. Mr. Ronaldo Snipes is mostly known for his 1981 battle with Larry Holmes, in which he dropped the champion before being stopped. He never became champion, but his brawls were very entertaining in the aftermath of the Holmes bout. He was up for a big money fight against Mike Tyson in 1990, but broke his hand and lost out. He retired in 1993 and today can be found raising funds for charity in New York. He is also big in the New York cigar lounge scene. The unfairly coined Great White Hope, a notion he openly shunned by stating the best boxer should be decided in the ring and not by skin color. What was equally unfair was how he was fast-tracked to a matchup with Larry Holmes when he wasn't ready yet. As with most, Jerry Cooney was a rising star who hit the wall far too hard, far too early. He beat three notable names from the Golden Age in Jimmy Young, Ron Lyle, and Ken Norton, earning him high marks and exposure in the boxing public. After losing in a valiant effort to Holmes, whom he became friends with after the racially promoted match, Cooney only fought five more times. One a stoppage loss to Michael Spinks and another a knockout at the hands of the resurging Big George Foreman, which would be his final fight. In retirement, Jerry founded the Fighters Initiative for Support and Training, which helps retired fighters find work. He's also involved in boxing unions, promotion, and advocates against domestic violence. Today, he lives in peace with his family. Glad to see another warrior turned out all right, and may he continue prospering. Randall Tex Cobb, a man of many interests ranging from boxing to kickboxing to acting, all of which he did well enough in throughout the 80s. He scrapped with notable names, the most notable being his 1982 title bout against Larry Holmes, in which Larry almost broke his fist on Cobb's face. He fought to mix results against other names like Ernie Shavers, Ken Norton, and Jimmy Young. At one point, he had a 20-fight undefeated streak against average opposition. Randall retired in 1993. Cobb was in a lot of shows and movies, but my personal favorite role of his, and I may get some slack for this, was his brief stint in Ace Ventura Pet Detective when he beat the piss out of Ace's car for the detective taking his dog. Sadly, he lost his eldest son in 2001. He's maintained a good life since hanging up the gloves, having gained a bachelor's degree in sports management back in 2008. May this absolute badass reign forever. A man's man, indeed. Michael Dynamite Dokes had the tools, but lacked the will. He got some early clout in a 1977 exhibition against Muhammad Ali, more so famous for how Ali dodged all of Dokes' punches while in a corner. Though he was winning as a professional, his inconsistent performances held off his big shot. It would come against Mike Weaver, and, as mentioned, Dokes won both bouts in controversy. He lost in his second defense against Jerry Katze, and admitted he was using cocaine up to two days before the bout. Time began passing him by, eventually leading to his amazing fight with Evander Holyfield in 1989. He would go on to be decimated by Razor Ruddock in 1990 and continue struggling with addiction. His last big fight was against Riddick Big Daddy Bo in 1993, and he was squashed. He retired in 1997 at almost 300 pounds and would be arrested for attempted murder on his fiancée 
the next year. He was released in 2008 and fell back into his addiction, leading to his death on August 11, 2012, from liver cancer. A sad waste of talent from a man who could have been an excellent champion. When Muhammad Ali retired, the WBA organized a four-man tournament to decide their champion. The finals between Kate Say and John Tate was culturally significant in the South African age of apartheid. Jerry was outpointed by Big John. He would eventually snag the WBA title from Michael Dokes in 1983, breaking his hand again in the process. But chronic hand issues prevented him from defending the title for 15 months. A bout with Larry Holmes for unification wasn't brought to fruition due to promoters refusing to raise the money for the purses. His first defense would see him lose by knockout to Greg Page, reviving the Neon Leon Sphinx curse. He never regained championship prominence and had mixed results in his remaining fights before retiring in 1993. He retired to farm life and motivational speaking in South Africa. Not bad for an otherwise average champ. He made the best of what he had. From Louisville, Kentucky, and trapped in the shadow of said city's lip, came the Louisville rage, Greg Page. Like Dokes, he also had an exhibition with Muhammad Ali. As a Don King fighter, Page had a great start to his pro career, capturing the USBA title before being derailed by Trevor Burbick in 1982. He bounced back before failing to capture the WBC title from Tim Witherspoon. He then lost the USBA title, but defied the odds and captured the WBA title from Jerry Katze. After losing said title to Tony Tubbs, in his very first defense and inheriting the curse from Kate Page continued against world-class competition to mix results. Unfortunately, Page is remembered as being a good fighter who could never win when it mattered the most. His last fight was tragic. He was dropped and received no medical attention as the bleeding on his brain grew. He suffered a stroke after complications from surgery on the brain injury which left him paralyzed. He died on April 27, 2009 from suffocation after a fall out of his bed. Rest in peace, champ, and if only we'd seen the realization of his potential. He was no joke when at his best. Inkland Thomas beat his addiction to heroin before his career began at the age of 20, but remained plagued by cocaine. Like all the rest, he had a red-hot start to his career, capturing the WBC title from Tim Witherspoon in 1984. Made one defense against Mike Weaver before Trevor Burbick took his title and momentum. In 1987, Thomas challenged a growing supernova, Mike Tyson, and was knocked down the only time in his career. He rose from the knockdown, but the fight was waved off. His next big date was a stoppage loss to the new heavyweight on the block, Evander Holyfield, in which Angelo Dundee would leave his camp after. Hiatuses, followed by rusty and inconsistent performances, ensued as Thomas faded out. He managed to overcome his cocaine addiction around 1989 and lost to up-and-coming prospects Riddick Bowe and Tommy Morrison in the early 90s. He retired in 1993 and would go on to start Project Pink. Pride in neighborhood kids. He can be found passing on his boxing knowledge to young fighters and doing motivational speaking. A solid start to Tubbs' career got him Don King's attention. He snatched the WBA belt from Greg Page and lost it in his first defense against Tim Witherspoon, continuing the curse from Greg Page. He backed out of the rematch due to injury and fell out with Don King. He was blitzed by Mike Tyson in 1988 and continued on inconsistent as ever. Cocaine abuse was at the center of his career at one point, even seeing him do some prison time. But he's managed to beat his addiction. He also fathered 16 kids 
and failed to pay child support at points. He seems to be decent enough off now, living away from the light. Carl, the truth, Williams, was only 16 fights into his career when he was arguably robbed of an IBF title win over Larry Holmes. He never fully recovered mentally from the loss, admitting as much. His next big fight would be a first-round stoppage to undisputed champion Mike Tyson, of which Williams felt the fight was stopped too soon. He became a journeyman after losing to Tim Witherspoon, Tommy Morrison, and Frank Bruno, before retiring in 1997. I skimmed his career, but Carl was a darn good boxer with size and skill. It was his chin that derailed him. He got his nickname because of how he made others believers in him. There's also an Easter egg of sorts I'd like to bring to your attention, but that'll be in a later video all about Carl, the truth, Williams' curse. Carl lost his daughter to leukemia when she was just 12. He worked as a security guard before his death in 2013 from throat cancer. May the truth rest in peace. A good start for young Witherspoon led to him catching Don King's eye, which led to his unsuccessful challenging of Larry Holmes. Some believed Tim won the fight, but his time in the championship picture was just beginning. Greg Page's Don King troubles led to Tim's WBC title reign, of which Witherspoon would then have his own war with King. He dropped the title and went on to win the WBA title, losing it at his lowest point under Don King. He never got another title shot after suing and parting ways with King. He retired in 2003 to training other boxers, including his own son. Terrible Tim also remains active in online boxing communities today. You can catch him in forums and even leaving comments on YouTube videos. Keep on strong, champ, and congratulations on beating the King in court. The light heavyweight master turned heavyweight champ is the second of the success stories here. His stellar resume has been overshadowed by his being retired by Mike Tyson. Regardless, he doesn't seem to mind as he's retained his health and fortune while living a reserved life away from the limelight. He visits schools to inspire kids occasionally. A nice turnaround from the fate of his brother. Live on strong, champ. Jesse Ferguson turned pro at the age of 25 and spent the 80s as a journeyman after being stopped by Mike Tyson. His big moment came when he upset Ray Mercer in the early 90s, earning a shot against unified champion Riddick Bowe. He was swiftly beaten by the champion. The ups and downs continued for the rest of his career until he retired in 1999. He tried comebacks after, but nothing materialized, and he fell blackballed. He's living a peaceful life now away from the madness and may continue to do so. Watch out for the boogeyman. James Tillis worked toward a 1981 title bout against Mike Weaver, but ultimately fell short. His glaring stamina issue kept him from success until it was apparently squared away before his bout against Mike Tyson in 1986. He gave Iron Mike a tough fight, but fizzles from here as he continued to fall short. He retired in 2001 and continued his acting career. He remains an honored son of his home state, Oklahoma. Mitch Green spent the majority of his career fighting for higher pay, most notably against Don King. His feud with Mike Tyson was in and out of the ring, providing some good drama. He retired in 2005, and the Tyson drama remains a sour subject for him. He and a fan struck up an unlikely friendship that has lasted to this day. Quite heartwarming. Reggie Gross is most known for the one round of excitement against Mike Tyson in which Tyson put on a dodging show before flooring him. Trumping anything he did in boxing, however, are the three murders he committed, which have landed him in prison for life. Marvis Frazier, the son of Smokin' Joe was known most for his losses to the two best fighters of the 80s in Holmes and Tyson. In that regard, he is just like his father, 
as Joe only lost to Ali and Foreman, the two best of his time. Marvis retired in 1988 to become an ordained minister. A packed resume against the best of the 80s and 90s, but unfortunately, Jose Rabalta lost most of these affairs. Him almost taking Mike Tyson to distance is what we most remember, and Mike himself gave Rabalta the honor of being the strongest man he faced with the best chin. Rabalta alleges that Don Keen blocked the 1990 rematch in Tokyo, instead granting it to Buster Douglas, and we know what happened on that night. Seems he continued chasing Tyson's ghost, as he expected to be Mike's 2020 opponent over Roy Jones Jr. He's alive and well today, working as a security guard. The Great Derailer himself. He is the only man who fought Ali, Holmes, and Tyson. I refer to Trevor Burbick as the Great Derailer because of his timely wins over John Tate, Greg Page, Mitch Green, and Pinglin Thomas. He also took champion Larry Holmes the distance in a bad blood feud that lasted another 10 years, culminating in the dropkick. After the Tyson loss, he fizzled and made little more noise in the ring until retiring in 2000 due to a blood clot in his brain. He was a preacher outside of the ring and also trained fighters. In 1992, he was convicted of raping his kid's babysitter. On October 28, 2006, he was murdered by his own nephew over land disputes. After turning pro at 28 and losing his first fight, James Bone Crusher Smith rebounded well en route to becoming a champion. His upset of Tim Witherspoon led to the Mike Tyson fight in which Bone Crusher held Tyson the distance. It was the end of his prominence as he floated around the division until retiring in 1999. He's an ordained minister and has done much to give back to the sport in his life quest to keep kids away from drugs and aid impoverished fighters. Keep up the great work, champ. Obviously, James Buster Douglas had his moment in 1990 against Mike Tyson, but he was a contender in the 80s beforehand. Though largely inconsistent, Douglas was formidable at his best and strung together some good wins at the end of the 80s to earn a shot at Iron Mike. He also had a great title fight against Tony Tucker, of which he would come up short. He lost the undisputed title he won from Tyson in his first defense to Evander Holyfield and spiraled. After reaching almost 400 pounds near death, he rebounded to return to boxing as a journeyman before retiring in 1999. Nowadays, he's back home in Columbus, Ohio, helping young fighters in the same gym he came up in. He'll forever be known for executing the biggest upset in sports history. The measuring stick, Tony Tucker, was undefeated until his admirable championship fight against Mike Tyson. After said bout, he got caught up in drugs, but managed to rebound well until losing to Lennox Lewis six years later in a title bout. He got one more shot against Bruce Eldon but fell short. He fizzled out until retiring in 1998. Not much is known regarding what he's up to in 2022, but I read an interview from 2008 in which Tucker said he trains boxers at a boys club in his bid to give back. Tyrell Biggs won Olympic gold and did well in the pros until running into the invincible Mike Tyson. His entire career and life since turning pro has been plagued with fighting off addiction to drugs and alcohol. He's clean now and teaching boxing to kids. A blessing to hear that he beat his demons. He is seen more as a 90s heavyweight because of his successful resurgence in said time, but he fought for nine years in the 80s. Perhaps if it weren't for Mike Tyson's existence, he may have become a legit champion in the 80s. He almost fought Tyson in 1989, but Tyson claimed he was ill and pulled out, leading to the Buster Douglas upset instead. Would it have been Ruddick who would have upset Mike had fate not intervened here? We'll never know. What he did to Michael Dokes will forever remain 
as one of the nastiest knockouts in history. The two fights he went on to have with Tyson drained him, and he never regained such form. After retiring, he ran into some financial issues that forced him to file for bankruptcy. He seems well enough off today and is in good health. Lastly, we have the man who ended the lost generation and unfortunately suffered as its last victim, Mike Tyson. His story is common knowledge these days, so I'll be brief. After the Sphinx fight, he fired his team and slowly dwindled in skill. Don King did his usual dirty work in pimming out the young champion, uh, allegedly. He was convicted of rape. He came back and never regained top form. The expectations he set in the 80s proved impossible to live up to in the 90s. He's lost a child, one of the worst pains one can experience. He's had a tough life from the beginning. But despite it all, he has managed to rebound as a national treasure. He may be one of the wisest men we have today, and his hot boxing podcast is awesome. He might be an even bigger pop culture icon now than he was in his boxing prime. Either way, we must protect Mike Tyson at all costs. Stay strong, champ. The fates of the fallen, and we honor the fallen, wondering what could have been. I'd like to extend a shout to the British crop of Lost Generation fighters, of whom will receive their own video. We can only hope and pray that there will never be another generation that falls under the same curses. May all affected by the events surrounding these gentlemen either find or rest in peace. See you next week. For the conclusion, as we see how the events of the lost generation shaped the coming Silver Age of the 90s. It wound up being a beautiful yet tragic bridge between the Golden and Silver Ages of the 70s and 90s. Despite the sport's gradual decline, starting here, it remained at the forefront of interest. It may have helped that movies like Raging Bull and the next two entries into the Rocky franchise reminded the masses of the glory days of the sport. Don King's monopoly, however bad the lasting effect, did lead to some stacked cards where the best contenders were facing off, even if champions weren't unifying. Though history has closed the book on this era, some maintain that its reputation and title are overblown, using comparison to other eras to make their case. For example, the frozen out and overlooked four black kings of the 1910s are seen as a far worse blemish on the sport, history having been robbed due to the color bar. Of course, they'll have their own video down the line. The spotlight of drug abuse during the 80s has been attributed to the culture shifting more focus to just say no. Fighters had always abused drugs and alcohol, leading to them slacking on their training. Fair point. It is also cited that decades often always have one or two dominant champions with other contenders. The 80s is only highlighted due to the timing of the sanctioning body splintering the title. The point that detractors make is that if the bodies rose in the 70s, Fighters like Ernie Shavers and Jerry Quarry would have been champions too, so what's the big deal? Again, fair point. Don King is the universal scapegoat for the failure of some fighters, but didn't they all still live and die by their own decisions? Yes, King employed questionable practices, but it's argued their choices led them down their tragic paths more so than anything. Some of these men were making bad decisions before Don even entered their lives. Another fair point, but context is key and the domino effect is in play here. King may have been either the spark to start the fire or the straw that broke the camel's back. Looking into other eras, like the 50s, reveals the same inconsistency of the 80s. Four men held the title and many challengers were up and down in their ventures. The same occurred in the 1930s. Decent enough point. Drug testing before and after fights came into prominence in the 80s, 
something that would have allegedly detrimented many fighters in the years before had it become commonplace. Darn fine point here. So is it better to address the 80s heavies as just another group of underachievers then? Maybe. The timing of their downfall coincided with the zenith of drug culture impacting celebrities. It was the beginning of the sanctioning bodies flexing their weight and diluting the sport. They were the unknowing guinea pigs and ran the wheel as instructed. One of the biggest what-ifs for fans was how the decade would have played out had George Foreman stuck around. He would make a scoffed at comeback in 1987 and claim he'd regain the heavyweight title. As the 90s dawned, more and more saw that Big George wasn't kidding. Still, it's fun to speculate on whether any of the names from the 80s would have been champs if they had to get through a still prime George Foreman. We'll never know. The big catch-up would come in the 90s as heavyweights underwent further evolution from the Ali style in the 60s and the Tyson dominance of the 80s. The coming warriors were bigger, tougher, and driven. Tyson would sabotage his chances at holding the fort aiding the opposition. Tyson's leftovers and other remnants from the Lost Generation feature early on as the big three of Holyfield, Bo, and Lewis work to establish themselves in the shadow of the baddest man on the planet. The 1980s would go down as the first alphabet soup era, and the 1990s, despite Iron Mike's unification conquest, would do the same. The fighter who resurrected Alphabet Turmoil, ironically enough, is one of the biggest what-ifs of the 90s, as some believe he squandered his potential. Despite his Hall of Fame career, Riddick Bowe may have well fit in with the 80s crop, though instead of drugs being his undoing, it was the refrigerator in alleged lack of drive. It would take seven long years for Balance to return after Bowe dumped the belt a time period that saw every branch of the title be in the hands of a different man during one stretch. Also during this era was the prime of Ray Mercer, who notoriously fought well against 90s heavyweights, but struggled against those from the 80s. It begs the question of how he would have done had he turned pro earlier and fought prime versions of the Lost Generation. Speaking of the remnants, Evander Holyfield began a trend of taking on Lost Generation leftovers to gear up for the division en route to Mike Tyson. Riddick Bowe, Lennox Lewis, Tommy Morrison, and more would do the same. Morrison is another lost talent from the 90s who may have fit in well with the 80s crop. His fast lifestyle ultimately caught up to him after costing him a worthy career at the top of the mountain. In his case, it was the partying and women that derailed him, leading to his HIV diagnosis, forced retirement, and tragic aftermath. Of course, Don King remained on the block during the 1990s, still firm in control of the sports inner workings. The less said, the better. I say that all to say this. Some appeared to learn from their predecessors, and some didn't. The 1990s was another peak age for boxing, but it also could have been better, having hosted another large roster that very well should have surpassed those from the 70s. Not to be. For a detailed look into the sequel to The Lost Generation, the 1990s heavyweight division timeline is linked below. Whether you still choose to address them as The Lost Generation, as coined by Jack Newfield, is entirely left to you. I, for one, will because they had the roster, talent, potential, and personality to surpass both the 70s and the 90s. Godspeed to any and all future generations who stake their claim at becoming the best ever. Well, with all that said over this docuseries, which I'll be releasing a super cut of in the coming week, there's only one thing left to do. This has been the Charles Jackson, author of the Boxing Encyclopedia, and I'll see you next round. Stay frosty.